So hello everybody and welcome to the uh, ESDR Kitchen. For those of you who are not uh, too familiar with our kitchen, it refers actually to a series of uh, live events that the ESDR has been uh, organizing for uh, the past few months to try and maintain some kind of scientific communication uh, during those uh, challenging times. So we have within the kitchen four series of events, the recipe book where new techniques are being presented, the freshly baked series where recent and groundbreaking discoveries are uh, discussed. Um, we have uh, the molecular cuisine uh, of uh, today where uh, leaders in their field share uh, their personal uh, journey to scientific uh, discovery and the sweet and sour series where two protagonists discussed a, a controversial topic. So uh, this is it for today. And I will now let my co-chair, Professor Bernard Homi, to introduce our distinguished uh, speaker of today, Bernard. Thank you very much, Ellie. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Masayuki Amagai uh, for the current recipe at uh, the Molecular Pre Cuisine. Masa Amagai um, is professor and chair at the Department of Dermatology at Keio University in Tokyo, Japan. He also serves as dean of uh, Keio University, University School of Medicine. He's also a team leader of the Laboratory for Skin Homeostasis at the prestigious Riken Institute. Currently, Masa Magai is also president of the Japanese Dermatological Association. He received his training in dermatology um, at Keio University after his study, in, uh, also at Keio University in uh, 1989, uh, to 1992, Masa Amagai served as a visiting research fellow at the dermatology branch in John Stanley's lab at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda. Um, he is also um, rewarded by um, a numerous amount of uh, awards and one special aspect in his vita is that he is an international member of the National Academy um, of Medicine in the US. His scientific oeuvre uh, contains 473 publications with a citation of over 20,000 citations. His age index is currently at 73 and his scientific fingerprint spreads from autoimmune bullous diseases to skin homeostasis and groundbreaking work in skin science. So it's a real pleasure to hear your talk and your title is already describing the sophistication, how you approach science in dermatology. And Masa, I'm really looking forward to you, your recipe today. Oh, one thing I have to mention before you start, uh, first of all, to all attendees, that your questions can be put into the chat and uh, we will address them after the talk of Professor Amagai. Moreover, I would like to thank Sanofi for sponsoring this event and to help us make this series a success. So Masa, please give us your recipe. Thank you, Vanath for very, very kind introduction. And uh, could you hear me okay? Okay. So uh, also I want to thank the Ellie and Chris and the ESD uh, program committees for giving me a chance to talk in molecular cuisine ESDL kitchen. 
I am honored to be here today. Although I am not sure whether I have a good recipe, the most precious ingredient is people. And meeting people truly enrich your life and my life. I'm lucky to be able to meet so many great people in this community of investigative dermatology. So this is COI. Please allow me to start with a very sad news. Hiroshi Shimizu passed away on February 17, 2021 at the age of 66, exactly one week ago. Hiroshi loved ESDR and had many friends and colleagues at the ESDR. Hiroshi was like my big brother because I have been always chasing his back or steps since medical school at Keio University for more than 35 years. His motto was challenge and he was always chasing new challenges throughout his life. Hiroshi will be greatly missed, and his contribution to the dermatology community will be never forgotten. My Japanese mentor is Takeji Nishikawa. Nishi raised me from the first year of dermatology resident and guided me to the field of investigative dermatology. This picture was taken at BAD, British Association of Dermatology, annual meeting at Brighton, 1998, when Takeji Nish Nishikawa was received, also look oration. And the BAD had a very good tradition to wear a black tie at the uh, social uh, event. When I was younger, I have been always thinking break out of your shell and go abroad. I am still young and I want to do it again sometime near future. But anyway, in 1989, I went to NIH and met two wonderful lifetime mentors. They are Steve Katz and John Stanley. Without them, I would not stand here or sit here today. This picture was taken at IID 2003 at Miami Beach. John guided me everything from a scratch and taught me everything. He actually taught me how to make American coffee in his kitchen on day one in US. Steve taught me how to carve turkey on Thanksgiving day. Steve was very proud of his electric knife. These all things happened during my first week in US in 1989. And my first lesson started in the kitchen. Steve and John must have foreseen that ESDR kitchen would happen in 2020 30 years later. During next years at NIH, as well as decades after NIH, Steve and John taught me many recipes for life, which was very precious to me and my family and my colleagues. Then my journey of chasing after simple logic behind a complex disease pamphigus has begun. And journey always start with a simple question. My first question was, what is a pemphigus autoantigen? In 1989, it was known that patients with pemphigus vulgaris have circulating IgG autoantibody against 130 kilodalton glycoprotein, but it was not known what is a 130 KD pemphigus antigen. So the first project as a postdoctoral fellow was to isolate cDNA for pemphigus vulgaris antigen by 
immune screening Lambda GT11 expression library with patient IgG as an antibody probe. After a struggle of a year and a half, we managed to succeed and the PEMFIX antigen was identified as a cadherin type cell cell adhesion molecule found in desmosomes. Termed desmograin or DSG, DSG3 for PEMFIX vulgaris antigen and DSG1 for PEMFIX foriaceous antigen. By this cDNA cloning, the fundamental pathophysiology of PEMFIX was revealed that IgG autoantibody block the adhesive function of desmograins with resultant blister formation in the skin and the mucous membrane. Then I went back to Japan in 1992 and started to work as a clinical dermatologist in, in an affiliated hospital and wanted to, wanted to continue research and needed to have a very simple and focused project with limited budget and less than one horsepower as human resources, because I only had just by myself after five o'clock. So I decided to determine whether patients see a loser pathogenic activity when anti-desmograin one IgG was removed by immunoabsorption with recombinant desmograin color. To express recombinant desmograins, we used bacterovirus expression system using cultured insect cells to produce recombinant proteins efficiently and economically. And this is the uh, picture of the, after the removal of anti-DSG1 IgG with recombinant desmograin one from PF CELA. And this is the immunofluorescence. And this is without column, the it stained keratinocyte cell surface, but the, with a one column pass through, eliminate immunoreactivity almost completely. When I first saw this immunofluorescence picture through the microscope at 11 o'clock in the evening, I was very confused that I thought that uh, I expected to the intensity may reduce less than the uh, control, but I didn't expect that the immunoreactivity is completely gone because the uh, uh, patient CIRA has a heterogeneous polyclonal antibody. So it, when I saw this, I thought that I forgot to add patient CIRA. But next day I repeated the experiment, but that was the case. The, uh, uh, basically, the reactivity is gone, and all, as well as the pathogenic activity, because uh, when you inject IgG the, uh, from the pass-through fraction of the column, the neonatal mice did not develop blisters anymore. So therefore, we conclude that anti-DSG1 or anti-DSG3 IgG autoantibody are the major, if not all, pathogenic autoantibody in PEMFIGUS. One question is solved, always next question comes. And if there are any good use of recombinant DSG protein as a clinical application. And because the, uh, these recombinant protein uh, expressed uh, proper uh, 3D conformation and also the uh, most, of, uh, most of the conformation of epitope, we use this recombinant protein for diagnostic tool or desmograin ELISA. And the recombinant desmograin was coated on the bottom of the 96 well. And then if the PEMFIG CELA exists, they bind to the bottom and these PEMFIG CELA detected by anti-human IgG uh, conjugated with peroxidase and they change the, co uh, the color indicates the existence of PEMFIG antibody. And this ELISA is used for serological diagnosis of PV and PF and also used for monitoring the disease activity because the ELISA titer often uh, fluctuate in parallel with the disease activity. And uh, this is uh, uh, approved by Japanese insurance, health insurance in 2003 and also used widely throughout the world. 
The next question was, why the splits occur at different level of epidermis in PV and PF? PV splits uh, occur in deep in the epidermis, while the PF splits in the superficial. Why is that? At that time, we didn't have good explanation. But John and I came up with the uh, one uh, theory, the decimal grain compensation theory. Because uh, 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 in the skin and the mucous membrane, the, uh, there's a two isoform of decimal grain expressed, but the expression pattern is different. In the skin, decimal grain three expressed in the lower part and decimal grain one expressed throughout. And in the mucous membrane, decimal grain three is a major one and expressed throughout and decimal grain one expressed uh, lesser to a uh, lower degree. So if an anti-DSG1 IgG exists, they block the function of decimal grain one, but the lower part is uh, compensated by decimal grain three in the skin. So therefore the uh, superficial blister occur. But in the mucous membrane, decimal grain three protect and compensate the loss of decimal grain one function. So no mucosal lesion. And uh, this uh, logically explains the site and, uh, of the blister formation in Penfigus. But uh, after we uh, solved this uh, compensation theory, uh, we came up with the, uh, another disease has a similar clinical feature with a superficial skin blister and no mucosal region. That was the SSSS or a, a staphylococcal skull skin syndrome and its localized form bullous in petigo. So we thought that it must do something to DSG1 and that was the case. And uh, uh, when the extra toxin I inject in mice, decimal grain one stain is gone while decimal grain stain is, remains. And the, uh, by uh, uh, incubate with the recombinant decimal grain one and three, decimal grain three uh, intact, even after ETA treatment, uh, but decimal grain one is cleaved to a smaller fragment. So these experiment uh, indicated that extractive toxin are decimal grain one specific serine proteins. So then, we uh, wondered the upstream event of pathogen called antibody uh, production. So we really shift the gear more towards the real immunology. Uh, and the mission is to characterize decimal grain three specific B cells and T cells. To do that, we need to have active disease mouse model for Pemphigus. So, and also we uh, took a very unique approach using old antigen knockout mice because decimal, in this case, decimal grain three knockout mice do not have tolerance against decimal grain three because the immune system in these mice are never exposed to decimal grain three. So, it, it, so we immunize decimal grain three deficient mice with recombinant decimal grain three, but in these mice, there's no antigen antibody interaction because this mice lacking the target antigen. Therefore, after the immunization, we took peripheral lymphoid organ like spleen and lymph node and adopt free transfer to the recipient mice. In this case, lag 2 knockout immune deficient mice that can adapt the uh, uh, splenocyte or lymphocyte from the uh, decimal grain three knockout mice. And in this recipient mice, decimal grain three specific T and B cells are exposed to uh, native decimal grain three and expected to have stable production of anti-DSG3 IgG, even though that was a very artificial uh, condition. And the mice actually developed very characteristic uh, phenotype of Pemphigus vulgaris. This mice uh, continue to uh, produce the uh, anti-DSG3 IgG as long as six months, and those uh, antibody bind to the keratinocyte cell surface in the skin and the mucous membrane, and also the uh, uh, typical histological picture. And because decimal grain 3 alone antibody induce mucosal dominant type of PV, so those these mice 
develop the uh, uh, erosion in the uh, mouth or esophagus or for stomach where desmo grains re express. So they couldn't eat well and drink well. So they have, they show the weight loss. But the good thing uh, about this model is that in this mouse, there is a desmo grain three specific B cells and T cells. So next step is to isolate those B cells and T cells. Faster B cells. And with B cells, we want to answer the question, why do patients show different disease activity, severity? In other words, some patients show severe symptom with very low titer, while others show mild symptom with high titer. Why is that? To answer this question, we isolated many uh, B cell hybridoma cells from the uh, PB model mice. Then we isolated as many as about 20 to 25. But most of the antibody, when they are injected or hybridoma cells are inoculated, they produce antibody which bind to the decimal range three in vivo. However, those mice do not develop phenotype, indicating this desmograin 3 specific monoclonal antibody is non pathogenic. While the last one, called AK23, bind to the keratinocyte cell surface and induce the blister. So they are pathogenic. So even among desmograin 3 specific antibodies, there is a pathogenic heterogeneity. Their strengths are different. So we decided why they have a different pathogenic strengths, and it was mainly due to the epitope. The very strong uh, pathogenic activity, uh, AK23, bind to the uh, uh, functionally very important part of the molecule or uh, adhesive interface, because the cadherin or desmograin 3, they bind to each other at the amino terminal adhesive interface. And those strong ones directly block that part, while others bind to the uh, uh, functionally less important part of the molecule. And just recently, Cho and her colleague uh, proved that in, even in human, uh, this is the case. They use a single cell analysis. They isolate desmograin three specific uh, B cell at single cell level and made the human antibody and uh, measures the uh, pathogenic activity. Red one is a pathogenic and uh, black one is less pathogenic. And uh, most of the antibodies raised in human patient, they attack the uh, uh, amino terminal functionally important part of the molecule while the others, uh, they are less pathogenic. So next, question was T cells. T cell is kind of commander in chief in Pemphigus because the Pemphigus is the uh, IgG autoantibody mediated disease. But T cell must play a role in this Pemphigus. But also we wondered because the Pemphigus is a rare disease. So most of us normal people have a, some way to eliminate uh, desmograin 3 specific harmful T cells. But how desmograin 3 specific T cells are eliminated in normals? Only in thymus, because thymus uh, is a central uh, uh, tissue for the tolerance. So we wondered only in thymus where and how desmograin 3 specific T cells are eliminated. To do that, first we have to isolate desmograin 3 specific T cell clone, because if you look for those in normals, they are already eliminated. So uh, we isolated desmograin 3 specific T cell clone from PV model mice. And not only that, we combined with the B cells, the adult two transfers recipient mice and determined whether those T cell induce uh, pathogenic antibody production and induce the PV phenotype. And actually eight out of 20 clones are pathogenic. Then those T cell clones uh, 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 have a very limited 
life span, like uh, uh, six months or uh, uh, at most one year. So we uh, isolate T uh, cDNA for T, T cell receptor and made a T TCL transgenic mice to use for the uh, further experiment. The central and peripheral trans to Desmograin-3. Desmograin-3 specific uh, T cells are uh, uh, generated with bone marrow and they move to the thymus. And in the thymus, Desmograin-3 is actually expressed in MTEC, medullary uh, thymic epithelial cells. And those MTEC uh, eliminate Desmograin-3 specific T cell. And therefore, in the periphery, you don't see it. But without Desmograin-3, they are not eliminated, so you can see it in the periphery. So we make the very unique condition that in the thymus there is no desmograin 3, but in the periphery, there is a desmograin 3. So desmograin 3 specific T cells are moved to thymus. They are not eliminated, move to periphery, and they uh, encounter to the endogenous desmograin 3. And the question is whether they are activated to induce phenotype or some disease condition or they're, they're they are deleted. To test this, uh, we use the nude mice. Nude mice do not have thymus and do the uh, thymus explant. And when we explant the wild time thymus, the uh, desmograin 3 expressed both in thymus and periphery. But when you uh, explant desmograin 3 knockout thymus, in the thymus, no desmograin 3, but in the periphery, desmograin, there is a desmograin 3. Desmograin-3 knockout, there's no Desmograin-3 both in uh, these tissues. And then we did the bone marrow transfer uh, of uh, Desmograin specific TCL transgenic mice. So after the bone marrow transfer, Desmograin-3 specifics uh, generated the bone marrow and the move to thymus and the move to uh, periphery. Then we analyze those Desmograin-3 specific T cells. First, in the absence of Desmograin-3, in the thymus, this is CD4, CD8 staining. There's a double negative, double positive, a single positive CD4 T cells exist, and also in the uh, periphery because there's no desmograin 3. But in the wild type, uh, uh, my thymus control, the, in the thymus, desmograin 3 specific T cells are eliminated. Therefore, nothing, almost none in the periphery. So, in this condition, what will happen? In the thymus, the, because there's no desmograin-3, so they are not eliminated, but in the periphery, they are eliminated, and mice do not show any phenotype. So this... Sorry. Uh, so in this... Uh, experiment shows that in, in the uh, periphery, there is a deletion. There is a mechanism, the peripheral tolerance in the uh, uh, skin and uh, lymph node. And to further uh, uh, do the experiment, we do the adaptive transfer of the Desmograin-3 uh, specific T cell, which are developed in the absence of Desmograin-3 to the uh, uh, Desmograin-3 expressing mice this is the sort of uh, peripheral to peripheral uh, transfer. And in this experiment, when we uh, adopt to transfer to Desmograin-3 knockout mice, Desmograin-3 uh, specific T cells are not eliminated, but in the presence of Desmograin-3, they are deleted. So we use this uh, recipient mice and modified in many ways. Uh, deleting some subset of the cells or blocking some molecule and try to understand the mechanism of the, the, this deletional uh, tolerance. And then when we use the uh, uh, D-reg mice or eliminate uh, T-reg by deflated toxin, then uh, the to transfer the desmograin 3 specific H1 T cells, this deletion was canceled and the mice show the phenotype. So this set of experiment indicates that T-reg playing a very important role for the deletion of tolerance in the periphery. So as a next step, we try to um, use this T-reg 
uh, for the uh, a new therapeutic strategy. So this is the uh, uh, almost last slide that uh, uh, today recipe for life in my molecular cuisine is uh, this message. If you cannot explain it to a six year old, you do not understand it yourself. This is by Albert Einstein. So always look for the simple question and simple answer. And uh, this is the big statue of the uh, Albert Einstein in front of the National Academy of Science building. And this is the old uh, colleagues who, who has uh, all the hard work to make this uh, finding possible. Thank you very much for your very kind attention. Thank you very, very much, Masa, for this uh, fantastic talk. Um, we uh, have really uh, little time for uh, maybe one uh, quick question. So uh, one question is, how, how do we, so, so now we have a molecular mechanism for understanding the pathogenesis of pemphigus, but uh, do we have also molecular uh, insight in, uh, to, to try to explain the varying severity of the disease among patients. So we know that the disease can be extremely severe or very mild, and there is a whole spectrum of severity. So how can we, uh, in the light of what you have discovered, try to understand also this variation in severity and maybe learn from that to better treat our patients or something like that? So uh, thank you. That is a very uh, uh, good question and also the tough question. So one uh, explanation for the heterogeneity in the disease severity is uh, can be explained by pathogenic strengths of anti-desmograin-3 IgG, which I showed in my talk. And uh, because uh, each, when we isolate each molecular antibody, they have a, they bind to the different part of the molecule and uh, some epitope uh, is, uh, 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 more important, so it, it uh, antibody has the more severe effect and end up with a severe phenotype. But not only that, may, maybe the uh, as I mentioned in the T cell story, there there is a um, uh, uh, some laws by T cells. So to uh, understand the complete picture, we really need the uh, dissect of the uh, immunological pathophysiology of the autoimmune state in pemphigus. Did I answer your question correctly? Yes, thank you very Sufficiently. much. Sufficiently. <laughs> yes. So Masa, I'd like to very, very much uh, thank you for this uh, beautiful talk. Uh, we, I think we've all learned a lot uh, about pemphigus and uh, also about uh, what makes you really a so great scientist. Uh, so thank you so much for having been here with, with, with us. I would like to invite you all to our next uh, ESDR Kitchen uh, episode, which is due March uh, 10th. It is part of our Sweet and Sour series. And uh, um, in this uh, episode, Ralph Post and Andrew Messenger will debate about uh, the possibility to cure andro androgenetic alopecia. So please do not miss that. And uh, just in conclusion, I'd like to uh, thank you all for having been with us. Uh, stay safe wherever you may be. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye, Marcel. Bye-bye.